What's up, everybody? Kit Cummings here. Thank you so much for joining us with the Power of Peace podcast. We're here at the Power of Peace Project headquarters, right off the square in Marietta. And uh, it's time for another podcast. We've got producer Mike in the back. What's up, Mike? Hey, what's going on? How you feeling today, bro? I'm feeling wonderful, man. It's a good day to be alive. It's always good to work with you, man. You too. And we're usually in the studio at Above the Cloud Media yeah. over in Powder Springs today. Thanks to uh, Comcast doing yeah. a little, little work over there, not thinking about the working man. That's right. Um, but it's good to have, uh, have you here in our studio. So, it's good to be here. You know, I want to jump right in, Mike. I, um, I had a, um, just one of those weekends. Sometimes you, you get to experience things that you've never experienced before, which is a huge part of my work. I mean, that's, I, I encourage people in a lot of the coaching I do is sometimes you have to uh, intentionally put yourself into uncomfortable situations. Yeah. And it's hard to grow if you don't. And um, I'm blessed to be able to, to work at a field where I pretty much get to do that every week, if not every day, <laughs> you know, get into a situation that's filled with new, you know, new experiences. And especially with young people, uh, the Power of Peace Project, nonprofit, um, we interrupt and redirect young people who are on a perilous course and set them firmly on the pathway to extraordinary dreams. And really through the youth, we begin to heal wounded communities from the inside out. And so working with kids all the time, one, keeps me pretty young and, uh, and somewhat relevant with what's going on with young folks. But it also um, is quite alarming these days. And, um, you know, what on uh, Tuesday I was at Cobb County Juvenile Court, which is one of the programs that uh, the Power Piece, POP is what they call it, P-O-P-P. -P. But Pop works in the schools, the juvenile courts, juvenile detention, partners with law enforcement, and also does work with churches. Um, and so I was working with my beautiful young knuckleheads at juvenile court, and I was teaching them about irresponsible social media. Mm. And, um, and it, was, it was fascinating getting inside the young mind of today's kid. And it's kind of like asking a fish, you know, what's water like? And the fish is like, what's this concept of water you know what i'm saying it's like the more you're around something it just is what it is and this young generation has grown up with these devices and um i started asking questions i'm like all right for the first time in human history we can measure how cool somebody is yeah. you know back in the day when i was a kid cool was like who your friends you know which girls you had talking to you know what blah whatever the popular kids and now through uh, their media and these devices without even trying. Like if I stumble across somebody in business and I'm like, oh, you check them out, whether it be uh, LinkedIn or, or you're wherever they're at, and you're like, huh. And you notice like how many people follow their stuff or you look at a couple of their posts and you're like, three likes. And, and automatically, I don't know about you, but my brain is built to go, okay. And, and as opposed to if you see something blown up, you're like, oh man, they're all that. Right imagine being 15 and having that kind of pressure on you, you know what I'm saying? Likes, subscribers, views. And we talked about things like now when a fight breaks out, what's the first thing you do when those kids are like, record, you know? And I told them a story about this kid in New York City, this teenager that came out of a, a little, um, you know, some little store and he got jumped on by a couple guys and they weren't even looking for him, they were looking for his brother but they couldn't find the brother. You know, it was probably gang related, young people. And tragically, they stabbed this boy to death on the sidewalk in New York City with a crowd of 90 people around them and everybody was filming it. So we're living in a generation in a culture where, I mean, that sounds like something we would have watched on some apocalyptic movie back in 1980 about what 2024 is going to be like and it's right. like people are literally recording a murder and then the game is the first one to drop it wins you know what i'm saying because their cool points go up right and i started asking them i'm like well what gets you cool points on social media and they talked about um obviously you know drugs you know guns fights is big exposing people um, sexy kind of stuff is always going to be, you know, pictures, um, whatever it is. But yeah, I, I showed them that if the pressure to be cool um, relies on how much activity and play you get around sex and drugs and violence and gangs, and these are kids that are under gang suppression, probation. And I said, you realize they are watching your social media, right? And they're like, mm, whatever. 
and you go to their, they're under charges. They're looking at jail time. They're in our program trying to get out of trouble, which they will if they complete it. And you go to their social media and they're like throwing up signs and got guns and weed and they're at a party blazing up. And I'm like, do you understand? And, and I was trying to get them to see your freedom hangs in the balance and you can't keep from posting what you need to post. It's called incrimination. <laughs> it's like that. I said, do you know how easy it is? And they're like, man, we just make a fake Instagram, a little Finsta. And I said, do you not think our investigators over here, can, they, they, they figure that out quick. They just look at who you're connected to, blah, blah, blah. But my point was, they're growing up in a gangster culture. And most of them, I poll them. And it's like... Um, how many songs a day to, do you listen to on, on the regular? And because all of them got earpods. Right. And they're riding to, cl to school, hallways, classrooms, after. I said, how many songs in a given day? And what do you guess their answer was? Average. Probably 30, 40. No, 100 easy. Oh, wow. Some are like 200. I'm doing the math going 200 times three minutes, you know, a song, whatever. But it's around 70, 80, 100, and I'm like, okay, do you realize that every one of them are stories? And you might not know it, but your brain is paying strict attention and learning from everything you give it, all the images, sounds, tastes, smells, and everything you feel, but especially what you watch and what you play. And so if a dude is getting 100 songs, and what's, what's the hottest song? Give me an artist, and they'll throw out some kind of name. I don't know what it is. And uh, I'm like, what's it about? It's trap. It's the same thing that we're talking about with um, their social media. What's cool? Yeah. Gangster, you know, guns, violence, whatever. And I'm like, okay, so now what video games are the hottest? And they're like, Grand Theft Auto. They always say that first. And I'm like, what do you do with Grand Theft Auto? Crime. It's just crime. And I said, there's an allure to I get to do what's illegal. Yeah. It's the only way I can do it. I can fantasize. So I said, what are some things you do? You can shoot cops. You can go into a strip joint. You could, you know, hurt a lady. You could do anything you, your brain can imagine. And imagination is the creation process, right? Wow. So I said, y'all need to understand that that character that you're being entertained by, everything he's doing, your brain is living through that character. Yeah. So I say all that to say, if young people are listening to 50, 60, 100 songs a day, which are just violent, and then they're playing, they're practicing violence on their video games, they're glorifying it on their social media, their movies, like, you know, Purge is all about killing Call of Duty. They love that one. How many people do you murder in one game of playing that? A couple, couple hundreds and hundreds. And the brain normalizes and really kind of just gets dull to whatever it sees a lot. And so it's not a surprise that, that this culture, and I'm not talking about tough kids in the inner city. I'm talking about yo-yos out in the suburbs that are soft as cupcakes that are all gangster. You know what I'm saying? And so then all of a sudden you're presented with a real situation like we saw at McEachern High School yeah. right out in front of the school. And I saw the video because somebody got it yeah. sitting in their car, put it on Facebook. Then it becomes a part of the case. These kids don't get it. And it's just this little beef, a couple little kids, and they're about to throw hands. But then one of them pulls out a gun and the other partner pulls out, pop up, and everybody runs. Two kids got shot. Yeah. And it's like, I think it's the... And the last thing I'll say, and I'm curious your feedback, is a gun culture has now reached, I'm talking about our young ones. Can you imagine growing up in Cobb County, Mary, Georgia, I'm 14 years old and I'm looking around, who can sell me a gun? Yeah. It's foreign, but not to these kids, bro. So I don't know. That's kind of in a long way I want to set up kind of what I'm talking about is some of the things that are bothering me this morning about the threats facing our youth. You know, it, it's interesting that you say that. It, it actually brings me to a question, right? And the question would be, when you saw that video at McKeetra High School, like, what did that do for you? I thought about, I mean, I get to work with these kids. Yeah. Like, the ones we see on the news, that's our wheelhouse. So right now, it's the four, 14, 15, 16-year-old kid that's getting in trouble, whether it be school with the law or maybe they're already sitting down in, in DJJ. And I get a chance to, and my team, um, we interact and get to know these kids that we just see on the, the news. And when I saw it, it just shook me because I'm like, those are my kids, man. Mm -hmm. Those are the kids that we love so much and that we're imploring with them 
you got to change direction. So when I was talking to the kids down at um, Fulton County Detention Center um, yesterday, I was like, um, do you think that kid got up? Because he got shot in the stomach, and he very well might be wearing a colostomy bag for the rest of his life, okay? And he's a kid, and they're going to jail. Who knows how long? A young kid, well, 17, whatever. Um, and I'm like, did this kid wake up and think, this is probably what I'm going to do today? I'm going to go get shot today? No, it wasn't on his plan. It wasn't something that he's going to try to get in, but he made a decision to have a gun near him, and he didn't have a plan for that not to happen. See, and that's the, what we're trying to get kids to understand is if you don't have a plan of where you want to go and you go with the flow, that's dangerous these days. It used to maybe be okay. Maybe kids just, they might not have a great life, but they're not going to you know, die or go to prison. And so they, it kind of was an epiphany. It's like, nah, he didn't plan not to do that. He's hanging out in the park after school, hanging around guns, and all of a sudden, you know, they're, they're, they love saying, oh, man, ops, ops like which is called their enemies. Enemies, a couple kids in a freaking, you know, parking lot. Why you got to be an enemy? Because they're watching it their whole young lives. They're watching it and they're playing it, they're listening to it. And now being around a gun produces dopamine because anything that you've been kind of forbidden fruit, yeah. it produces brain chemistry and it's kind of like the bad boy has always been kind of cool at school. Some there's something about it that like a lot of girls like the bad boy. Well, now all the kids, they won't be bad boys. Yeah. So what did it make me feel? I think it, it kind of, it didn't shock me, but it alarmed me. You know what I mean? It, it's just, I love these kids so much. But I want to shift gears a little bit. This past, uh, past weekend, um, I got to kind of peek behind the curtain into um, a culture and a community that usually, um, let's say brothers of less color, you know, my age and kind of where I live and where I grew up, don't necessarily get to ever experience. I do because of my work, you know, and the kids I work with and their families. But when I was doing some work down at Eastman, which is a, a YDC, it's a juvenile, more like a juvenile prison. Kids have been convicted. They're doing terms, you know, two, three, four, even five years. And um, I connected with a young man. And I can't say it was the best uh, start to our relationship. You know, saying it actually, the start to our relationship was a threat <laughs> because this little kid, he's not big. He wasn't old. He was 16 when I first got to know him. And I noticed that the little dude was like running things. I'm like, how does he stay safe in here? Because he ain't a big kid. And, uh, and then I saw the tattoos begin to show up on his face. And they all mean something. And I'm pretty hip to that stuff. And, and so I'm like, man, I got to win that kid. And I would try to win him, try to win him. And, and uh, like he wouldn't even dap me up, but he would kind of come to my group. But he wouldn't talk, and he'd just glare at me, and he wouldn't dap me up. And so every week I'd go and try to dap him up when we were leaving. He wouldn't look at me. And then one day, finally, he dapped me up, but he wouldn't look at me. And then I started, when, when I'd go by and see him, I'd say respect. And he wouldn't say anything. And then next week I tried to dap him up, and I'd say respect. <laughs> and he, he wouldn't say anything. Finally, one day, he kind of went, respect. You know, and he's got to show me, all right, I see you, you know, whatever. And then it got to be, it was like we'd really see each other, and I'd pull him in before I left, and I would say in his ear, I'd say, you're a good man. And then I'd leave. And then the next week, I'd come over and pull him in, I'd say, you're a good man. And then I would leave. And what I was doing was kind of, I was planting seeds in his mind and trying to win his respect and his trust and maybe his love one day. And, and then they shipped him off. And he went to another camp, and I didn't get to see him, and I was bummed out because I thought, man, I never got to reach that kid. But I forgot to tell you, when, before he left, he warned me. So after I'd been working on him, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, a 16-year-old kid's like, don't you come back in my dorm next week. And I'm like, come again? And he's like, don't, I'm just telling you, don't come to my dorm. I said, or what? And he goes, you don't get to know. I'm, just, I'm warning you. And I went, all right. <laughs> so I left that day going, I don't know. I guess that's a credible threat. I don't know. And so, anyway, I kept working on him. Of course, I didn't stop going in his dorm and whatever. And so, he finally got shipped off. But then he got out. About a year later, he got out. And through another young friend of mine, he, uh, he hit him up and he said, man, I want to go see Kit. So, my young friend, Quez, if anybody watches the show, they know Mark Quez. Um, he said, hey, D wants to come and see you. And I'm like, uh-oh, he's going to come and see me? <laughs> I said, I thought we were cool. And he goes, no, no, he wants to see you. And so he brought him up from Columbus. And we, I took him out to a restaurant. And I didn't even think about it. It's a very nice restaurant, but not to me. It's just a restaurant on the square. 
him and Marquez were just like, it was kind of like, what's that movie? Um, Dangerous Minds. Yeah. And you remember Michelle Pfeiffer yeah. takes the kids to the restaurant and they're like, they don't know what to do, yeah. you know, with the cloth napkin and the menu and don't know what to say to the, the server. And it was, it was so sweet. It was kind of like that. But I look over at him and I say, D, what was up with all that, man? I thought we were cool. Were you like threatening me and stuff? And I was kind of messing with him. And he goes, nah, bro, it wasn't like that. I just couldn't let my boys see me, you know, be weak. And which helped me kind of understand he's got pressure that I don't know. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? He's got rules that he must follow that have nothing to do with me. I got rules I want him to follow. He's got rules he's got to follow, yeah. you know, with, with his code, right? And so it was a cool little connecting point. So then it became, I'd reach out to him every now and then. He wouldn't hit me back. He was still kind of in the streets. And, and then he started hitting me up every now and then. It's like, yo, kid. And then I would say, what's up? And then nothing, crickets for a week. And, you know, but it showed me he's thinking about me. Yeah. There's something he remembers that he wants. And so that became our little thing. And then I, one time I reached out to him. I, he was on my heart. And I said, hey, little brother, make good decisions today, man. And he hit me back right away and said, man, that was right on time because I was about to do something really stupid. And I don't know what that meant, but it was bad in his world. And it was like, he's getting it. Okay, well, about a week ago, Marquez pulled me aside and said, hey, D's brother got killed. And I find out that this young friend of mine that I've been working on for a year to try to reach this kid, he's now 18, and, um, and his 16-year-old brother got murdered in the streets. And I was like, oh, it hurt me because we lost another one. But obviously my first fear was, what was he going to do? Right. What my partner was going to do. He was going to get back. You know, I mean, that's their world. And so um, go move to Saturday. I know that was a, an intro. But um, I decided I was going to go to the funeral. And all the way down to Columbus, tough little area. You know, some people, you know, that love me said, I don't think that's a good idea. Because a lot of times funeral homes can get shot up, you know, especially if it's a gang-related murder, kind of retaliation kind of situation. And I was like, man, I got to go support my young brother. Quez hit me up that morning, and he said, um, hey, D's not going. And it's the day of the funeral. And I'm like, what do you mean he's not going? No, nah, he's not feeling it. And so I'm going to support him. I'm not going either. And I was like, why would he not go to his brother's funeral? And there was a lot of answers to that. Could be some retaliation there. Maybe he can't stand the sight of seeing his little brother in that coffin um, or casket. Um, you know, maybe uh, there's, you know, he's got active beef in there with somebody. Or maybe he just, you know, a lot of them will not go because they don't want to face the fact that that could be me. Right. And so there was all kind of psychology. So I left it up to Quez and I said, um, do what you think's right. But I want you to think about one question. How's his mother going to feel if he's not at his brother's funeral? And so I said, but it's sacred, none of my business. But Quez, you know the kid, you do your thing. And so he went and he worked with him and he called me up and said, we'll be there. And I said, bet I'm there. And so I went down and I, I drove into this community, in a tough little community, big funeral home, and there's people everywhere. It was packed. And everybody's wearing T-shirts. And they all have a picture of this young boy and then rest in peace, you know, his name. And I was like, this whole community is wearing T-shirts for this young man, which I know in a lot of uh, people's culture and history, that's a normal thing. I don't care if it's a reunion or if it's whatever, but I was like, this is a funeral man in every whole community. There was a lot of one particular color represented, and I'm not talking about skin color, I'm talking about clothes, yeah. um, that represented the organization that this young man, you know, obviously was affiliated with. And I don't really know, I've been processing how I felt. One, I did feel like all eyes were on me because I stood out, yeah. you know, and I asked the boys down at Metro, I said, who do people think I was? And they said, cop. <laughs> they said, you're an undercover cop. And I felt like that. I felt out of place, but I also felt a part of this community because I was surrounded by a community that had come out to mourn and grieve. And I've been to a number of memorials for young people and they're always sad. But out here, maybe in the suburbs, for a kid that maybe isn't from that, dies of an overdose or a suicide or a drunk driving accident, something that's tragic, the whole community pours out, and it's almost like we feel, this isn't fair. We're mad. Why would you take us? This isn't the way life works. There wasn't that feeling there. It was, it was almost as if these beautiful people do this a lot. 
They were very good at it. From the preacher, we had church, to the young mothers getting up and imploring the young people to get out of them streets, to the singing, to the fellowship. But it wasn't that they cared deeply, but they were used to doing it, yeah. which broke my heart. You know, I was like, man, how could a community, that's how much they experienced this. And so then I went back to my boys down at Metro Fulton County. This is Fulton County. These are these kids. You know, the anybody knows Rice Street is the nationally publicized jail in Fulton County in Atlanta, Georgia. Well, this is like Junior Rice Street. This is where the young ones are housed and while they're waiting on their cases or whatever. And um, I told them this experience and they were locked in. You know, I mean, this was their world, but it wasn't shocking. I said, would you guys have gone? And they were like, nope. They probably wouldn't have gone. Wow. So young men die and their friends don't come, which is like, okay, I'm starting to understand why. And then I said, what's the next move if, if this is you? And they were like, got to retaliate. And I said, everybody? And they're like, to a man, yes. And I said, have to. And they're like, yeah, help me understand why. And they basically started giving me reasons, but what they were describing is this code of the streets. It's like, this is a must do. What comes next? And there's no other option. And I said, is there any option where you make another move, which means you're gonna, for you, you're gonna change the street code. I'm not operating by that code anymore. Enough is enough. And I couldn't get them to fathom it. And it's like, nope. So it's like they're living in a world where their hand is forced to play by the streets rules, which gets them jail, or death, period, point blank. And every one of them know that. And they tell me that their lifespan is around 20. Okay, they're living in a world where a young man who's 15 thinks he has five years left. And these young dudes, they call the 18, 19, 20 year olds old heads. And I thought, how do you call a 19 year old an old head? I'm the guy you're supposed to call an old head because I have an older head. And this uh, 18, 19 year old That's kid. And dude, I get the wisdom. Um, and the young dudes are like, oh, those old heads. And I started thinking in a very real way, in their world, they're old men at 19. Why? Because they got 20 years to live. Yeah. I'm not an old man until I get in my 70s because I got about 80. If I'm an average, average in America is 80. In their world, average is 20. And I'm going, my God, how do we stop this? And so... My question to them, and I'd love your thoughts, I asked them this question, it's powerful. I said, is it possible, I'm not saying is it probable, I'm saying is it possible that you could love something or someone so much that you'd be willing to change the rules for yourself? Step out of that code? Because otherwise, isn't it you hit us, we hit you, you hit us, we hit, and kids are going to jail and they're going to the, the, another memorial, they have more and more t-shirts. More and more T-shirts. The, I mean, this, the person that produces those T-shirts, unfortunately, has a thriving business, yeah. which is scary. Um, and they, they finally landed on, maybe, maybe I could love something that much, which is the basis of the Protect the Dream program in a very real way, is if you can get a human being, but hopefully a young mind, to develop a dream that's bigger than themselves, that has the, the power to pull them through things. That's what dreams do. You got a big dream, well, I don't feel like doing it today. You get up, you go to you go to battle. No, no, this is my dream. Somebody tries to threaten that dream and you're like, no, I'm not gonna do that, don't mess with my dream. That's the whole game and kids in today's world, we haven't taught them how to dream. Yeah. And so my question was, could you build a dream, whether it's you're going to go to school and get a diploma or go to college or learn a trade or fall in love, become a, a, a good, I asked them, do y'all ever dream of becoming a good husband and having a beautiful, faithful wife? And they're like, hmm. <laughs> it's like, they, I mean, I'm, I'm, my mind's blowing. And so they're beginning to think that, wow, if I love something enough, then maybe I'd be willing to make a different move. Does that make sense? Yeah. And it kind of brings me to, I guess, a, a, a closing, you know, little, little part here about solutions. Because when I first started um, doing some work down at, uh, it's called Metro RYDC, okay? So it's a juvenile detention in Fulton County. Um, the people, young people and old people and people in the business and everybody else said, good luck down there. 
Because they're kids, 14, 15, 16 year old, tough little kids, and they don't listen to nobody. And they play by, they don't even listen to their old homies like back in the day. You could call shots. You can't call shots to these kids. They can do what they want to do. And so I went in there thinking, man, this is going to be hard. And it turned out that, no, I mean, it's, it's really, I'm seeing things that I've never seen in my work. And these kids, they can't wait. They look so, we have a group day. You know, I mean, we do it Monday, Wednesday, Friday, so they see me a lot. Um, and when we're not having group, they're upset. And the ones are like, how come I'm not in your group, Mr. Kid? And it's like, wait till the next time. And so there's a hunger in these kids, which is um, uh, not satisfying, but it's uh, inspiring to me to believe that we can reach them. And so anyway, yesterday's um, class was a part of the book, Protect the Dream is the book that, you know, the platform and the curriculum that we're going through down there with them. Um, and the question, the pop principle, P-O-P-P, was we find what we believe we deserve. And I asked the kids, what does that mean? And they stumbled around and tried to figure it out, but basically it was like, they didn't really understand it. We find what we believe we deserve. And I gave them an example. I said, have you ever known a situation where um, a young lady is in an abusive relationship and whether physically, emotionally, sexually, whatever it is, abusive and, um, won't break out of it. And they're like, yeah, I mean, they've seen a lot of that. I mean, a lot of broken homes, a lot of single parent households, a lot of absent fathers, which is happening more than just in the inner city and the, and the impoverished communities. It's like, you know, where's dad? Um, but anyway, so they've seen a lot of abuse and they're like, well, maybe they're afraid to leave. Maybe they got nobody else to support them. Maybe they, you know, have just gotten used to it. And I said, or is it possibly that they don't believe they're worthy of better? Because we see a lot of, uh, tragically, someone leave an abusive relationship only to find themselves in another abusive relationship with a whole nother partner. And it's like, you got to get into the psychology of that. And what we were bringing it around to was, if you go back to those streets, now that you know better, because they've been interrupted, and now they're getting knowledge on a regular basis, making them think about their lives, they're going to go home to that same stuff. Do, be, do you believe you're worthy of something better? than what you see. And I told them, and I'll close with this, is um, I didn't know it was going to be so impactful. This happened to be with the young ladies yesterday. And um, these <laughs> they're a mess, but they're a blast. I love them to death. And they love this program. And so anyway, we talked about this concept, and I said, you know, the, the soul work I've had to do in myself, because I'm very open about my um, battles in my life with alcohol and drugs and, and depression and some things that's very real to them. And so I'm, I'm open with them about things. And I, and I talked to them about um, that concept about a little boy growing up in addiction and the fact that it makes you very insecure and affects your, your self-worth, what you believe you're worth, and your damaged goods in a lot of ways. And I said, I came up with three um, beliefs that developed in a little boy's brain when he was dealing with things that didn't make sense and he was trying to make sense of a world that confused him. And there are three fundamental beliefs. And at this point, the girls are, they're leaning in. And I said, one, things don't last. And all of them went, they're, they're nodding with me. And I'm like, wait, what does that mean? And I, I fleshed it out. We talked about it. It's like my brain came to a conclusion when I was young, nothing lasts. Things fall apart. I said, so when things get really good in my life, that little boy belief is still down in there saying, it's only a matter of time till the wheels fall off. And that's fundamental. And they were, now they're listening. The second one I said is, people always leave. Now, is that true? And they're like, and I said, always? And they're like, <laughs> they're trying to figure it out. I said, no. Things don't always end. Some things last, but I believe nothing did. Some people stay. Everybody doesn't leave. Isn't that true? And some of them are like, no, nope, everybody leaves. And so they're where I was, you know, in my mind. And then the third one, by the time I said, okay, things don't last, people always leave. And then I said, and it's probably my fault. Little girls, their eyes started tearing up. Now, the boys didn't get there when we talked about this. I mean, it was deep. It was a good discussion. But these little girls, and then one of them, toughest little girl named Lexi, she goes, 
dang, Mr. Kit, today you're talking to me, you know what I'm saying? The little tears are rolling down. I said, okay, let's talk some more. But I resonated with them, or that resonated with them, that it's like they believe, man, things don't last. People always leave. It's probably my fault. And their life doesn't have the value to protect it. So if a little boy uses them and mistreats them, if you believe that's the best you got, then you put up with it. If somebody tells you, hey, you do this again and you're going away, you're going to catch a real charge. It's like, well, I mean, that's what happens in my world. You keep doing this and you're going to die in those streets just like that little brother. It's like, and? You know what I'm saying? And, and lastly, we talk a little bit about spirituality sometimes, you know, when we get to that point. I bet 80% of these kids think that when we die, it's lights out and there's nothing that comes next. And I don't know if that's a process of, you know, just start over on video games or whether it's a process, but less and less of our kids believe there's any kind of afterlife or eternity or something that comes out. They're just like lights out. So why are you going to be afraid of dying? You know what I'm saying? So I don't know. I appreciate y'all all tuning in. And I, I, I hope that if you care about these things, one, subscribe, subscribe, share. Think of somebody that needs to talk about this. I mean, I guarantee you people are listening and watching today that they do have a kid that's starting to pull away and isolate. It's all, their, their behavior is changing. It's like this little gangster, their language and their, pay attention to those signs. You know what I'm saying? I mean, kids are, are withdrawing with depression because of all the stuff they're seeing. Anxiety is at an all-time high, especially with these kids. Their little brains are trying to deal with so much information and most of it is violent. And that's got to be a conflict in my mind if it's like, I know this scares me, but it's entertaining. You know, that's a dangerous combination. The enemy is out there and preying on the kids. And protect the dream, I've found, has power. Because instead of telling them, don't do that, don't smoke that, don't drink that, don't play that, don't listen to that, don't ride with him, don't go with her, don't, don't, don't. This generation, even more than ours, is like, tell me what to do. I'll do it. And we're driving them to do those things. And then somebody comes along and says, no, nah, let's figure out what your unique gift is. What do you really love? And where does your talent lie? Let's build a big dream around there. And I'm going to convince you that you're worth it. And now I'm going to teach you how to protect that thing. And you're going to break the mold, man. You're going to quit living by the laws of the streets. You're going to live by spiritual principles, you know, life. You're going to learn to value life. And I'm going to help you start dreaming about growing old. Let's start thinking about the old dude sitting out on the porch, you know, surrounded by grandkids, you know, having lived a good life. And in their little minds, they're starting to think maybe it could be me. And then we just start with one dream and then teach them how to dream. And then maybe we fix it that way. And I know there's somebody out there that just got so caught up in this. They're like, I've got lots and lots of money and I want to give to something like this. Yeah. I wish there was a way. Yeah. <laughs> Powerofpeaceproject.com. Powerofpeaceproject.com. Donate. Get involved. Send us a message. Um, comment on this video on YouTube and say, hey, can we talk about this? Give us ideas. We want to reach more and more kids. And if we reach the kids that are tearing things up, guess what? That means your little girl who's 15 at high school might not be bullied because we reached the bully. You know, your, your son might not take that Percocet at the party that's laced with fentanyl and we have another memorial. You know, maybe the kid doesn't get in the car with those knuckleheads that are getting ready to do something stupid and there's a gun in that car. It's like we just get kids to pump the brakes and think about that dream. So it could affect your family. That's why we need your help. Love you guys. Tune in. Power of Peace podcast. Dot com, and we will see you on the next episode. Be the change you wish to see in the world. Peace.